Well, good afternoon. This is Damian David with Cornerstone Advisors, and welcome back to my weekly review. Um, so last week, we got into it, I promised you 10, 15 minutes of the recap of headlines that we hear over the past week in coronavirus and in COVID-19 world. Um, also, I promised to share with you some resources to help you cut to the chase and you just get down to, to order and either reconfiguring your systems or setting up new technologies to help you uh, in your battle to provide care for your communities in the face of coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and then also we checked in with a couple of my colleagues. This week I'm going to do that as well. I'm going to talk to two of my colleagues, Wendy Gould. She's great in general financials, revenue cycle. She's got a couple tips and, and things to think about. Um, that that you'll um, that will help you in this time. Uh, it's exposing certain things like you know lack of documentation, lack of understanding where your resources are, lack of understanding where you can get resources, uh, availability, et cetera. Uh, just so we're gonna talk and chat a little bit about that. Hopefully that'll be helpful to you. And then I'm gonna check in with Joe Grinstead like we talked to last week. So much happens on a week-to-week -week basis in emerging technologies um, and technologies that are available. Um, so, you know, just going to check in with him, see what's changed over the week. Uh, keep in mind, Wendy, myself, Joe, we like to talk. So, you know, ideally, I need a couple minutes to, to keep this at 10, 15 minutes overall. Uh, and we end up talking once we get gone 20, 30 minutes sometimes. So what I've done is I've, I've, I've already called and talked to them. I'm going to trim that down, edit it into this video um for about the weekend review so that way i can stay within the confinement of those 10 15 minutes that i promised you um so it's a little bit more condensed uh, but if you're interested in hearing the full conversations i've also included the links to those down below too so please feel free have at it click on the links hear the full conversations again we like to have a lot of fun um, and talk with each other so uh, if you're interested you know i'm not trying to cut information out or make us look better by trimming all the good stuff um, that's available to you have at it again i just wanted to make sure that uh, we're keeping this time pretty condensed for you for the weekend review itself okay so here we go first headline cms uh administrator Seema verma had let us know they were doing a study where they were going to release data on how race affected covid19 uh, or how it was impacted by COVID-19, or how COVID-19 was impacted by race. Um, they were going to release that this week. They're pushing off. So they're just saying that there's a delay. Um, that's not going to come out until early mid-May or so. So they're buying themselves some time. U.S. is giving $200 million to eligible providers and hospitals to invest telehealth. Um, look into it. It's not new news. They've been doing this. I think they... Um, well, the docket was out and published uh, for review at least as early as March 27th. But uh, what I've done is I've, I've included the link. The online filing process is available down below. Click on that link. There's a couple people that you can reach out to if you have any questions on, on the application process, too. Um, I've listed their contact information in their LinkedIn links as well. So check it out. Make sure you, if you're eligible, why don't you try to see if, if you can help get help doing this, right? So I think as up to a million dollars is awarded for certain cases and there's 200 million available. So look into it. I think as of today, I looked, there was only 65 applications. So get to it. All right, Dr. Fauci warns COVID-19 cases could surge if stay at home orders are lifted too quickly. Hey, we've been at home way too long to ruin it now, right? So, you know, done a great job. It's been weeks, months. Stay the course, let's keep people healthy. Got a couple more weeks, maybe even a month in you? Please, keep it up. Facebook releases county by county maps showing people reporting COVID-19 symptoms. Um, it's interesting heat map, so it's a visual understanding of where COVID-19 is. Again, it's, it's self-reported, so you know accuracy from a testing perspective, it might not be 100%, but it is still interesting to understand where visually it ends up throughout our country. So I've put the link below, so check it out, it's interesting. Sunday, April 19th, protesters from Colorado, Illinois, Florida, Tennessee, and Washington took to the streets, parades, car parades, um, just to protest stay-at-home orders. So they want that lifted. They want to get out. Exactly opposite of what Fauci's suggestion was. Um, I don't know. Politically, I don't I don't know where I stand on it. I, I know my family and I are, were socially distancing, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, I think I might have even had it two months ago. I don't know. We'll find out. There's another headline that will speak to that um, in just a moment here. 
Uh, but regardless, it's like, I don't know, everybody's putting the hard work and keep it up. Um, in Denver, the healthcare providers actually protested the protesters. So, you know, they're on the front lines and they're like, ah, please stay at home. Um, the way, the method that they used was they stood out in the streets blocking the, the car parades. So um, it's interesting. There was some coverage on that. Go check it out. You can find it on everything from Twitter to YouTube to the news channels, et cetera. So uh, if you're interested, yeah, it's available. Um, Novartis gets the FDA green light today. Actually, they decided that, yeah, they're going to move ahead with clinical trial phase three. They're going to test 440 patients on an antibody test. No, back up. That was an error. They're going to test 440 patients on the effectiveness of using hydroxychloroquine as a effective um, measure to fight COVID-19. Okay. So right now, up till now, people have said, oh, yeah, use it. That's going to be our saving grace. And other people have been like, eh, I don't know. France has a study saying it's not effective. So um, Novartis is actually going to go test it. Um, again, we're, we're down into the process. Hopefully, we'll know a little bit more on the effectiveness. It's uh, historically used for malaria fighting the COVID-19. We'll find out soon. Um, this weekend, I got a text message from one of my friends saying, hey, this concert's great. You got to check it out. I didn't. I was busy, but uh, I'm going to. It was the WHO and the Global Citizen put on a One World Together at Home concert online presence. So some of the hosts were Jimmy Fallon, uh, Jimmy Kimmel, and Stephen Colbert. The performers were Lady Gaga, Andrea Bocelli. What a beautiful tenor voice that guy's got. Uh, Chris Martin, Eddie Vedder, Elton John, Phineas, I just Sabrina Elba, John Legend, Lang Lang, Lizzo, Maluma, Paul McCartney, Priyanka Chopra, Jonas, uh, Shah Rukh Khan, and Stevie Wonder, others as well. It's like eight hours. I'm looking at the link. I put the link down below. I'm going to actually watch it at some point. I got to find eight hours I can carve out of my week. Um, yeah. Go check it out. It's fun. I guess it supports the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. I've also put a link to that so you can find out what that is um, and how to get involved or participate, contribute to that as well. Okay. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I let, let you know last week he was sent to urgent care, uh, COVID-19. He was fighting it, not looking good. Um, he's stable. He's recovering. They've actually checked him out. He's now recovering at his countryside residence checker. So um, good. Good to hear. Great news. Last week, we learned the Smithfield meatpacking plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, had almost 300 employees test positive for COVID-19, and they shut down the plant indefinitely to figure out scope, impact, et cetera. Today, the Tar Heel, North Carolina plant uh, realized and, and found that some of their employees test positive, too. So investigation is just trying to figure out the scale of what's happening there and, and what the range of impact is at Smithfield. Um, they're like a, a meats, pork bacon check it you know you might have smithfield bacon in the freezer hold off on it just to figure out what's going on um see what the range is see if there's any risk um okay last week we started getting at the stats again i didn't want to be a downer but i think it's important to understand stats how we're being affected from a global world perspective as well as in the u.s so i'm going to run down on a week-to-week -week basis what the stats are i'm going to compare it to the previous week too just for point of reference so this week as of today as of hours ago um, globally, 2.9 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, up from 1.9 million last week. 639,239 have recovered from uh, around the world, up from 446,000 last week. 167,369 lives lost to COVID-19 around the world, up from 118,459 last week. So almost almost 50,000. Um, in one week. In the U.S., 778,027 confirmed cases, up about 200,000, over 576 last week. Um, 71,280 recoveries last week was 42,000, so almost doubling that. That's good news. Um, but almost double in the deaths, too. So we're up to 41,376 deaths in the U.S. from COVID-19, up from 23,068. Okay. Um, last week, we had mentioned that uh, Dr. Fauci said that within a week, so by last Friday, they were supposed to have an antibody test available to understand if you've had COVID-19. Um, not all the testing is accurate. Uh, myself, I, I was tested about a month and a half ago for COVID-19. I, I came out, I tested negative, but 
um, some of the people I were hanging out with and had the same symptoms of were tested positive. So I don't know. Um, this is a test that I'm going to go after. My my physicians have asked me to get just to understand if I actually had it or I have antibodies for fighting it in my blood. Um, right now, what we do know is there are reports of people getting finger prick tests. What we don't know is we don't know the test results and we don't know with any more accuracy that, oh, it's either 61 to 94 percent accurate. That's just too wide of a window for me. I, I, it was it was rushed through the FDA approval uh, under the emergency use process. There's not really much diligence in that. That's why there's such a wide range. It's I mean, it's maybe, you know, it, it might not work. We don't know. Uh, we'll know for sure. So in essence, we still wait to find out. OK, without further ado, let's get to the conversation I have with Wendy Gould. Uh, quick introduction. Wendy Gould is one of my colleagues here at Cornerstone Advisors, a very experienced um, especially in the world of Meditech. Um, she's also had ex experience with Epic and different forms of EHRs, but Meditech has been kind of her, her uh, base, um, everything from Magic to Client Server to 6 to 6 to Expanse. Um, really great in, in her knowledge and understanding of general financial, GL, AP, materials management, uh, on through revenue cycle, et cetera. So uh, without further ado, I just, I had a conversation with her early. It was great checking in with her. Um, I'll, here we go. Let's transition over. Hey, Wendy, how you doing? This is Damien. Thanks for uh, hopping on this video chat with me. Um, glad you had a couple minutes here and uh, I guess let's get started. Where, where are you joining me from? Good morning, Damien. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm joining from Watertown, South Dakota, where it is actually sunny today and almost 50. It's a good time of year <laughs> yeah. to have this, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old Watertown. That's uh, my son plays hockey against some of the eight-year-olds from Watertown, so I get up there a couple times a year. It's fun. Well, so. next time you'll have to stop by and see me. <laughs> I will. Yeah, it sounds like a plan. So, uh, give us a little bit of a background. How long you, uh, have you been with Cornerstone? Um, I am starting my seventh year with Cornerstone. Um, I've been consulting for 15 years. Like um, John Lim has me by about six or seven years. He was doing it about the time I met him. I've been working with him for ooh, we have the same amount of time. We follow each other around. Um, yeah, no, I've been consulting 15 years. I started in healthcare about 10 years before that. I did um, finance. I did budgets for seven corporations. And then I was in IT at Avera, which is a big hospital system here in South Dakota. And I installed the 15 hospitals in Minnesota, Iowa, and South Dakota for them, the whole Y2K thing. Yeah. So I did a lot of all of the implementations and a lot of support for the financial applications. So I do, you know, billing, AP, supply chain is the big one, revenue cycle, you know, anything around that, patient access, medical records, all that's good stuff. That's great. Wow, it's a wealth of knowledge there. And yeah, I'm glad to have you here at Cornerstone. Sounds like you came over right when... Uh, I guess 615 or Expanse hit the ground and yep. probably were responsible for the majority of our, our Expanse projects. I started with Magic and being an accountant with a background of that, the keyboard, you know, being keyboard driven was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I fast, remember right? having to teach nurses. I've had to teach, if you can believe this or not, PCS. I've also taught Epic and all of the clinical sides of that. That's funny. Bring back memories. I think about that time I was still at Meditech and I remember um, my first foray into Meditech was with implementation in, as an implementation analyst. And part of my job was to train uh, end users how to, you know, set up their dictionaries, use the system, et cetera. And I remember Magic just having that, I don't, the numbers keys on the top of your on right. the top of the keyboard for a computer. Right. They used to have this cheat sheet. It was yeah, like a little the function. plastic thing. Yeah, the thing that went around the function keys. Yep. Yeah, yep. we used to, people used to come train and we, we didn't have them available for sale or anything. People would just try to walk out of them from the training room. So part of my job was to make sure that nobody walked out and stole those from us. But yeah, those were a commodity back in the day. And I, I remember flying through a magic system. It was really quick and easy. So how are you holding up? This whole COVID-19, social distancing. I mean, you know, we're off the road and stuff, but like, how are you holding up? What's what's going on with this? This is the longest I've ever been home in the last 15 years now that I was calculating that this morning. Um, I'm holding up really good. I My kids are here with me. Um, they go back and forth to their dads a little bit, and I go back and forth to my husband who lives in Minnesota. Um so we make it work. So I, I still am on the road a little bit, but in a different way. I have to go to Sioux Falls every three weeks for um, on the downside of my cancer treatments. Um, so that's good. 
I, I got rid of it all, so that's good. That's great. <laughs> Just trying to do all the preventive stuff. So I still get out, like right now I'm doing radiation, so I go out every day, which is weird. So COVID-19 presents new different challenges. Um, what are you keeping your eye on? Like, where, where are you seeing that people are, are able to spend a little bit of effort or time focusing or thinking about how they do the general financial side of the house to help them through times like this? Like, what are some of the main topics, hot topics, main issues? Um, it, with supply chain, it's the vendor list, who, reference list. Um, GHX has kept theirs up. They just um, updated it last week. And GHX is the automated you know, for automated POs, automated invoices, your your vendors go through there. Uh, if you're if you're automated and Meditech and want to use that feature, it's usually used in the bigger hospitals and bigger cities because more vendors are tied to it. Mm-hmm. You still have your you know your local vendors. You have to ha- keep that relationship up with, and you're talking to them and making sure that you that you know everything's that you can get what you need, or you know that you've kept those relationships up. I think it's a good time for with materials management if you haven't you know set up things around automation you know letting it you know using the system to run the pick list see what you got deplete it you know take your inventory your par levels you might have to think about you know we were able to keep just in time inventory before Mm -hmm. you know i could get it in two days they're always trucking they're always moving um you know things might have slowed down where what are your high use items that you're not getting as quickly um I looked at uh, Becker yesterday. They have a seminar coming up about surgery, and I thought about that that was interesting, and also one about how people are handling the patient financial. I noticed, as an example, when I first um, got got cancer and started getting my bills, <laughs> it's a different side of it, right? Because now you've always worked in it, but now you're you're the recipient of that. Avera had a new mandate that January first they were going to call everybody, and they did. And I've noticed now with COVID nineteen, I've gotten none of those calls. Like if uh, I didn't pay the bill change. like right on the money or if I wanted to negotiate, they were on top of calling you before you even tried to pay. So they were, you know, they were doing so some of that collecting has gone away because they know people are in crisis. But how do we ramp back up for that? You know, how do we ramp back up for, OK, as an example, surgeries might start again in a month or two. Did we take the inventory, the supplies that we needed, you know, the gowns, the caps, the masks, the pads, the different things that we, you know, the IV sutures, everything, did we move it somewhere else? And now we've got to make sure somebody's got to go back in and make sure the surgery's ready, you know, that they're going to have to make sure they can get the items that they need, you know, order it ahead of time, you know, be thinking forward thinking, be more, think about resiliency versus strategy. Oh, I can get it just in time. Now I can't. So, you know, in how you can use a system to do those things. I think it's, it's, it's a very important time because it's changed, right? Supply yeah. chain has changed. Finances, collecting has changed. Using your accounting system, um, you know the way that you do. You need all that detail in your accounting system when you can get it out in the modules. I think I think they're going to have to really reimagine how they do supply chain and how they have used their system in the past. Especially since they've had to furlough, they've probably had to do some of that. You know, and there's going to have to be a bigger communication between uh, the clinical side and supply chain. I don't think I know surgery. We've really integrated that better. But, you know, with some of the other areas, they, they need to be talking more. Yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to use the system to automate a lot of things that slip through cracks. So Right. Well, yeah. we've always done it this way. Or, I like, for example, I live in a rural area. When I implemented hospitals, I know we used to get, fr- we're trying to count the inventory. Mm-hmm. And we're having to go to the little room in the floor because the nurses, because of the weather here, and you have it in Nebraska, too, they hoard things because, again, they can't get them yeah. in time. So it's it's... Some of that thinking isn't bad right now, right? Because of what we're going through. If you know where it is, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> and that's the problem. Well, Nurse Betty knows where it is, but nobody else does. But yeah, yeah it's, we had to go through a lot of drawers. I just remember the one hospital I did. We were in like weird rooms trying to find stuff that people had hid. Sure. To count no. the inventory. Yeah. That so. makes sense. These types of uh, these types of scenarios and events and situations really kind of expose um, those types of of things that happen in operations and organizations so it's really interesting right. i know i know you're doing some work on trying to put um some tips documents etc together i'm not sure if we're going to be doing a, a webinar coming up but I, I think we might uh, i'm not sure I, I think we'll probably try to help have you maybe put some help us put some things together for that okay um, uh, also you know keep in the back of your mind if there's things on the reporting side that you're seeing um, it, I'd like to maybe internally or talk to some of our partners out there, put together like a, a package that people can deploy rather easily to kind of 
start to approach some of the areas that, that you, you just mentioned. You know, I think this is an opportunity for organizations to just get tighter in how right. they leverage the system. You never know right. who's going to be here, who's going to come and go, who's going to be distracted, who's going to have to go back on the on the floor and actually provide patient care and right. can't get to the day to day. Oh, yeah, I know that this is under this notebook on this part of quadrant of my desk on Thursdays and right. then I, over on that shelf. But, you know, that's the type of stuff that that's becoming exposed. Um, and, you know, it's a style thing. It's a personal thing. I get it. Um, in these types of situations, though, it's really being able to leverage all the the investment that we've made into to health exactly. information systems that that really can really either help you or or become a hindrance or a challenge for you as an organization. So, right. So yeah, thanks for your work on that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> what's your prediction on when we get back to some sort of normalcy? I ask everybody, and it's interesting. They're they're similar but very different answers. I'm interested. Um, um it's funny to because today the doctor talked about that. If you can believe that. Um he said that they're looking here at trying to get the um, elective surgery part back up here pretty soon. Oh, uh, down in Sioux Falls, they're predicting the pandemic's gonna hit the middle of May for them. Right. They've transitioned right. all of their, um, the, the cancer center, for example, has been tra tra moved away from the main campus. They had a beautiful facility there, really relaxing, really calming, and they've moved it um, south of town into their new specialty hospital for right now. And you can tell the difference. You can feel the difference. And so it was interesting to hear they want to keep everything on main campus because of we have that Smithfield plant. Yeah. That they found so many workers, okay. right? Yeah. And yeah. I think that they're what they're doing is they're keeping all the buildings on main campus for the COVID-19 and moving everything else out. Anybody who's healthy is going to the specialty hospital. Gotcha. So, so they're, they're trying so to keep them separate. Yeah. 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 So we could be up, you know, I was predicting probably fall, maybe September, October, because then they could get in all those elective surgeries. People have hit their deductibles, right? So they mm -hmm. want to get it done before the end of the year if they've hit it. Um, so that's what I would say. But it was interesting for the doctor to say today they're really trying to get back up within the next month for surgeries or so. So and it, it really makes you reevaluate, um, you know, re imagine, rethink a lot of things that you didn't think about before. So, you know, I think people, I agree with John that we're going to see more clients who are open to, I think they have the initial meeting. We have to go there. We have to meet them. They have to get to know us and we have to do our initial workflow studies and things like that. But I think many of them will figure out, and I know I worked hard at my last client to get them to understand, I don't have to be here every week. I need to be in contact almost every day with people. So you may have to, you know, reimagine more of these types of calls. So I had really, really good success um, on my last two assignments with the same client, but different aspects of it, of not having to be there every week. Like we were able to get down to, I was there like every other week and it worked. We were on time. We were getting our stuff done. They they focused more when I was there. They really realized when I wasn't there, things weren't getting done. So yeah. it helped them re reimagine and reevaluate too. So I think it it's there. It's just doing it. And, you know, figuring out how, what works for you and the client. Well, great. Hey, thanks very much. You look thanks. great. I'm glad to uh, have you on the video chat. Thanks for 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 joining me here. And uh, okay. yeah, have yourself an awesome week. And I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Okay, thanks, Damien. Let me know if you need anything else. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Bye. Hey, that was great. I always love talking to Lenny. Again, you can get to the full length conversation. A link below. Um, you can also get to the full length of this next conversation I'm about to have with Joe Grinstead. So. Quick update, just to kind of feel in the pulse on where where the world of technology and, and healthcare in, in in light of this COVID nineteen coronavirus experience is. Um, yeah, check it out. Hey Joe, how are you doing? This is Damien. Um, how's how's everything in the world of Dallas, Texas? Hey Damien, things are good. Things are good. Situations evolving. We're here on a Friday afternoon and. We just heard that our governor has formally closed the schools for the rest of the academic year. So, um, but you know, I, I guess that's good depending on who you are, right? Um, yeah. But um, but he's also announced they're going to start looking at how to open up some of the businesses and things. So we're we're thinking forward, which I think is important for all of us to be doing right now. So hey, uh, let me ask you, what's what's changed since about a week ago when we talked last for this uh, video po podcast thing? Is there anything new? What kind of challenges do you see in healthcare phase? Well, I think, you know, some interesting things that are happening, you know, and again, I, I tend to look at the world from the IT perspective of things. 
um, a couple things that I found really interesting. One was the collaboration that Google and Apple announced to start being able to use mobile devices as contact tracing and stuff. And, mm. you know, on one hand, it, it's back to that creepy privacy factor problem, you know, that we all worry about. But I think it also emphasizes that what we're going through right now is a lot like what 9-11 was and, and other times in our lives when we've had to pivot new information and stuff. And, you know, if you think about during the Depression, we came up with the Social Security Administration and Medicare and gave everybody a number. And, you know, the, so people were willing to accept that because of the circumstances they were in. Well, I think people are going to be more willing to accept some sacrifice of their privacy about their location data on their device in order for us to be able to ease up on the social distancing and the stay at home orders and things. So I think, you know, again, it's just an example of we are at one of those pivoting moments in our society where several things are going to change. And I think we got to keep an eye on it because we certainly saw after 9-11, you know, the, the privacy and things that, you know, they got out of control. So I think we got to keep our, keep our eye on that as a society. But at the same time, it may point to a way that technology can give us back some of our freedom to move around and still feel safe. It's like a clash of everything, right? So we have this pandemic, we have an election year, we have laws in, in legislation that's changing rapidly, even, you know, whether it be for temporary reasons or who knows what's going to hold out and become more permanent. But yeah, mm -hmm. paradigm shifting and it's it's really interesting the, uh, what's happening here. Hey, uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about what AWS is doing in regards to, um, I, I hear they they they're giving access uh, to uh, data lakes throughout, you know, not just life sciences, healthcare, but all that. So, yeah, so it's actually a publicly accessible data lake running on AWS. Um, and what they've done is they've gone out and pulled in. So, so, so let me jump back a little bit for anyone who might not be clear on what a data lake is. And I promise I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but essentially, a data lake is a way to take, you know, myriad sources of disparate data, whether it's you know, Excel spreadsheets or CSV files or, you know, relational databases or even PDF documents and images and put them all into one place and be able to build relationships between them to do analytics over top of them. And um, so Amazon is real big on data lakes and, and really, you know, the power of the public cloud to help with those. So what they've started doing is pulling in data from various sources. They're pulling in data, I know, at least from uh, Johns Hopkins University, which has been kind of a a hub of data collection about the COVID-19 um, uh, spread and things. Uh, they're pulling in, you know, publicly available databases, census data, zip code data, and things like that. And they're putting it all in one place. And, you know, I, I know you're going to put the link to, you know, the article about it that um, tells about it. And I would really encourage folks to go out and kind of play around with it a little bit. Um, when you first click into the data lake, it almost just looks like you're in a Dropbox type of setup, you know, with fol folders and files. And what those are is that's all of the data that they've gathered. And that's really what a data lake is. It's just a big, you know, repository for files and, and data to be dumped in. But then what they do is they apply the technology over top of all of that. And if you look in the, the data lake, when you get into it on AWS, you'll see one that I think it's called dashboard.html. And what that'll actually open up is an interactive dashboard in your web browser that's looking at all of that data and using the data from Johns Hopkins, you know, about the spread of COVID-19 and overlaying it on geographic data and census data and things like that. So it's really an interesting, um, interesting display of the capability of a data lake, which is, is still in many places an emerging concept. Um, you know, I think it points to one of the things that I think will be really interesting coming out of this whole COVID thing is, you know, we have probably more data about COVID-19 than we've ever had about any health issue in history. And and we've we've gained that data in just a very short period of time. But that data, you know, you keep hearing it, flattening the curve. Well, that's just referring to what the data is telling us about that graph. And, you know, data will drive what we do and when we do. And I think what you're seeing is a model that we're going to be, you know, probably more than normal than um, before. And you're going to see more demands on healthcare organizations to feed syndromic information into centralized database repositories or data lakes. So as patients are coming into EDs or as patients are being lab tested and results are coming back, more and more of that data, is, there's going to be more push for that data to be fed in a more real-time way so that the next time something like this happens, we're going to want to be out ahead of it even more. And, you know, we want to be able to make decisions on a more targeted basis so we're not having to give 
broad geographic guidance, you know, across whole countries and around the world about people staying at home, but be able to say, hey, there's an outbreak happening here, take specific action there. And that's all going to be driven by that data. So again, the data lake's a great example of how all of that data can come together, use the power of the public cloud and, and tools that AWS has to really see that data. And if, you, if you're a data person, if you're a data jockey or a geek, you can tap into the data lake and put your own views and your own analytics over top of it on, on AWS. So pretty cool stuff out there and kind of neat that AWS is doing it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, how many people get in there and mess around with it, so to say, and, and, and kind of adopt the concept for what happens after this COVID-19 experience. You know, it's, I think what we're trying to do with population health and, and do communities and regions and, you know, country care, country-based care, this lends itself nicely to that. And I think as people get used to that technology and the availability of it, I'm, I'm interested and excited to see what's to come. So. And please, Danny, put my contact information in the, the video with my email address and my, um, my, my social media handles and stuff. I'd love to hear from people about this and hope you and your family are staying safe and wish that for everybody watching. And for those of you who are out there on the front lines, thanks for all you do. We're thinking of you and we appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Again, stay safe. Hopefully, uh, you know, your family and yourself will have an awesome weekend, and, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. All right. Take care, Dean. Well, hey, thanks for joining me yet again for my weekend review. I look forward to seeing you again next week. We're going to do this all again. I'm going to leave you with this week. I did mention we were doing a uh, Cornerstone Cares type of uh, program to help people where we can offer hours of, of assistance however they need it. Uh, in consulting professional services uh, give me a call uh, just us our team and uh, we care so so photos of us we're thinking about you thanks again we're very grateful for your efforts um yeah and then in the background last friday for lunch break coffee house i decided to play a song that's dear to all of our hearts as we're travel warriors uh, we just want to kind of get back on the road again so hey have a great week we'll see you next week thanks I just can't wait to get on the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again.